joining us from Sydney is the great Christopher Hitchens. How are you? It's a bit early to say. Now, I can't see you there. Are you smoking a cigarette in the studio? No. Okay. You stopped smoking in 2008. How's that going? Good? Um, it depends on the stress of the day. Sure. So a bit like Barack Obama. You know, he's supposedly stopped smoking, except when when you actually ask him the question straight, he kind of has this way to kind of wiggle around it. <laughs> well, no, his, his physician's report, which is mandatory every year, I mean, says that he, he still hasn't quit. And it's actually amazing how much of a free pass he gets on it, because if there's one thing on which liberal America is in 100% agreement, it's that you can't have anything to do with the tobacco industry. Well, I, I'm totally on your... Cause I'm, he looks I, so, but he looks so well on it. I know. So yeah, yeah. I'm on your side. I'm the only person in Australia who like cares that Barack Obama smokes. No one else is interested. Whenever I bring, you're the first person I brought it up with who even like engages with it on any level, doesn't roll their eyes. Well... Um, it's How do we ever, know since he Mrs. His eyes? ever since Mrs. Clinton, it means that he'll he'll have to go outside, at least onto a balcony in his own house to do it. Oh, you don't like the Clintons at all, do you? Not very much. No, I don't. What, why? Why? Why them as opposed to um, the Reagans or the Bushes? What, what did they well, ever do for you? Or the or the if, Obamas? If you have near you my um, my book Hitch Twenty Two, which is a memoir among other things of living in Washington over the last. Ah, three decades or so, you'll find quite a lot to amuse you about um, Reagan, Carter, uh, both Bushes, and the Clintons. But you really don't like the Clintons? Not much of it, not much of it, all that complimentary. But the Clintons seem like um, like just charming, you know, and good-humoured, and, you know, Bill was always up there with a saxophone and stuff. Well, I had the disadvantage of being at Oxford with him. Uh, I didn't know him. Particularly, I was present um, at the moment when he didn't inhale, which is now, as you know, quite a famous <laughs> moment. And I can tell you the story if you like. He didn't inhale because he never has inhaled. He, in contrast to Obama, is allergic to smoke. Ah, oh, yes. So the way that he would take his dope was in a huge hash brownie or cookie, mainlining it down like that. Mm. So he always knew he'd have an answer to the inhaling <laughs> question when it came. And, and only a few of us knew what a big fat lie it was and what a big fat lie he is. But that's pretty clever. You've got to admire that. It's like, um, clever in a loyally way. It's clever in a low cunning way, yes. Now, can we talk about your book, Hitch 22? By all means, you may. Now, um, of course, the exciting bit that happened in your life is when you suddenly discovered that you were Jewish or your mother was Jewish, and, and but she never told you. No. So what did your parents tell you about God and religion when you were growing up? Well, my father, who was very, very stoic, Southern English, Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Celtic, actually Hitchens is originally a Cornish name, had been brought up in a very strict Baptist home in Portsmouth, which is where the male side of my family is from. He was a naval officer for the, most of his life. And I don't think he wanted to inflict any of that rather stern Calvinism on me. So he, he was a refugee, if you like, from one kind of orthodoxy. And my mother was a refugee from... Judaism, not in, the, I think, in the religious sense, but in that she and her mother had both suffered a little bit of unpleasantness for it in the 30s. And I think she just didn't, this is only my guess because we never had the conversation, because she died too young. And tragically, as I have to say in the book. Um, but I'm pretty sure I know that she didn't want her boys to, to be picked on for being Jewish. And she wanted us to be English gentlemen. Yes, so just explaining to the audience, it's your, it was your grandmother who squealed? Yes, my, her mother outlived both her and my father and lived to the, see the point where my brother did what I've since done, which is marry a Jewish woman, and decided to, that there was no further point in keeping the family secret. So this has sent me all the way back to Poland, um, or what is now Poland, but when my ancestors left would have been Germany around the town, famous old town of Breslau, now Rochwov, to find out why they left and what the, what the backstory is. And there's a whole chapter about that in the book on the, on the Judenfrage, as is uh, sometimes used to be called, the Jewish question. So a lot of people who are angry, um, visceral, militant, militant atheists, it, it's because the nuns beat them over the head as a, or the rabbis beat them over the head when they're growing up and their parents mm. are in their case, on their case, dragging them to 
church, temple, mosque every week? If both your parents were... Oh, no, I'm not a... No, that's a, it's interesting you mention that, especially in the context of the, the present time. No, I'm not a religion victim at all. I was made to study religion and was taught it, um, as everyone has to be in England, where it is mandatory, as if it was divine revelation. But I'm quite glad of the education that that got me, and I have quite a lot in my book about the prayers and the hymns and the observances that are with me still and will be with anyone who's been through them at a certain formative period. So, so what, why, what, what do you think has made you such a passionate uh, spokesperson for atheism now, see, seeing you didn't... Well, the same as did then, which is what occurred to me then, which is it's all nonsense and quite dangerous nonsense and shouldn't be instilled into children and probably wouldn't have a chance of surviving if it wasn't enforced. And I've, I've always thought that as a matter of ontology and philosophy. But more recently, because, uh, because of its intellectual defeat and retreat, it started to come back in horrible theocratic and absolutist forms of the sort that we thought we'd left behind, or some people thought had been left behind. Everything from, um, well, Islamic Jihad, obviously, is the most immediately pressing one, but Messianic Jewish settlers on the West Bank trying to bring on the Messiah by stealing other people's property, a depraved papacy, um, a horrible Russian Orthodox church that helped in the devastation of Bosnia and is now becoming part of the sort of clerical bodyguard of the Putin dictatorship in Russia, which is very much being underestimated with its nationalism and chauvinism and demagogy, very much undergirded by the church. So, And to say nothing of uh, cretins trying to teach nonsense to American school children about uh, uh, what they call ludicrously intelligent design, in other words, creationism with taxpayers' money. So there's a big desire to push back against that. Now, and I'm one of the one of a group of authors who've decided to help organize a movement against it. Now, you just mentioned the Russian Orthodox Church. I, I read that one of the reasons you thought Lenin had his good side was because he destroyed that church. What, what, yes. What, what was so bad about the Russian Orthodox Church that someone that people find... Um, well, it was the church that supplied the justification of and was the profiteer of serfdom, in other words, slavery, among Russians for centuries, that preached that the Tsar was a, not a divine figure, they didn't quite go that far, but was a little more than human, was the head of, the head of a church and was, had a divine right to rule. And if you, which I dare say you have, have ever heard, and uh, your, your listeners will have heard of a document called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Yes. Which is, a, I have a little small campaign, by the way, against this. Um, it's often referred to as a forgery. I refuse to call it a forgery. A forgery is a copy of a true bill. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a straight-out fabrication by Russian Orthodox reactionaries that was adopted, brought to the West by them and adopted by the Nazi Party as a, and by many Christians as a Catholic and Protestant as a, uh, an apparent explanation of a secret Jewish world government and one of, the, one of the building blocks for the Judeo side. So we don't have a lot to thank the Russian Orthodox Church for. And they're coming back, you say? They're coming back as the, they're, the, they're the clerical guardian of the Putin neo-Stalinist dictatorship. In, in, in exchange, as before, for being a privileged church in Russia, they're allowed to discriminate against other Christian churches and, of course, against Jews and Muslims and, and unbelievers in return for which they're allowed to teach you know, as a more or less monopolistic force in the schools. And I, I'm increasingly worried in the armed forces as well. Now, Bob, you were saying that you I thought... I am the Catholic priest. But it's OK, you can have a go at him. No, 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 I'm nervous. No, 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 I'm saying Christopher can have a go at you. Oh, that's all right. But I liked, I agree with Christopher when he but, says that one of the, the only priests that he, he admires was in fact the Archbishop of Cyprus, Archbishop Macarius. Yes. Because um, I'm a bit of an admirer of Macarius too. Who's his chap? Even though he, I mean, it ought to have been the other way around. I mean, it was a big mistake for Cyprus to have yes. a man in clerical uniform as a president, yes. especially given that 15 to 20 percent of the citizens of Cyprus are Turkish, and though many of them are not Muslim, they're not certainly not Greek Orthodox. There were all kinds of contradictions, but he was actually a very brave and principled man, and charming too. And mm. I don't think, I must say, I can't prove this, but I, I feel that deep down I'm probably not a believer. <laughs> And also the other one I admire. Always an advantage in an archbishop. Now, Bob, you were saying that you thought Christopher was still what? a communist. And, and no, I, well, I'm a socialist. A socialist. Because yeah. uh, I'm a great admirer of George Orwell, and Christopher Hitchens is, is an admirer of George Orwell. But you said reading Hitch 22, you came to the conclusion that Christopher was for the invasion, or getting involved in Iraq from a, a socialist or communist perspective. 
What do you make of that, Christopher? I said he was in favour well, of the be... regime, Mr Saddam Hussein, early days, simply because it was a secular regime as opposed to an, as opposed to an imposed Islamic regime. But then, Christopher's, your conversion... Uh, I'm delighted at, at the record in your book because, in fact, it does give uh, it, it does it almost a forensic uh, proof that the war is was right. Well, um, the invasion very, was right. Rather. You're very flattering. The intervention, I'd rather call it. The, yes. the, the intervention. I, so I changed the terms, but I, I think that's a better word. I think also, we have to change the terms. I, so I think conversion isn't a word that really applies to me because I showed not that I changed my mind, but the way I did. Yes. The reasoning, if you like. It's not like a conversion experience. but And also, I didn't ever quite say I supported the Saddam Hussein regime, but I, I could see the, why many Iraqis did yes. in, its, in its early days, because Ba'athism was not um, religious. Yes, because but then... Were, and, as, and because a very large proportion of the population of Iraq isn't Muslim in any case. Large, yes, um, and you also remind there us... There are millions the, of Christians there, and until 1948 and the struggle over Jerusalem, there were more... Jews in Baghdad than there were in Israel. But you remind us too, thank you, that Saddam and his regime did in fact a segue from being secular to being um, fundamentalist uh, Islamic. Yes, it mutated in the secular form into a fascist regime, which it had always had some sympathy for, and as it had had some sympathy for Stalinism, in fact, and some relationship with it. And you're both but above all, above all, after the Iran war, it became, which many liberals refused to acknowledge, but which is absolutely inscribed in the entire record, and anyone can look it up, um, a regime absolutely wedded to the jihadist interpretation. But, but and you, it, it, di it died in that way. You, rightly. See, you rightly say that the invasion may well be perfectly justified, but in fact that the aftermath, you would, you, you would agree, d does, doesn't live up to our expectation of... Uh, no, but that's, that, that certainly doesn't. But though, I mean, it does, doesn't it stir you? It does me that... Um, you can read in an everyday report in the newspaper now that Iraqi parliament debates while the Iraqi Electoral Commission does the recount, while the Iraqi Supreme Court meditates on the consequences of the recount. It, it's surreal to read this, while the Iraqi newspapers and media comment on it. Astounding. It's surreal to read this if you knew what Iraq was like and had seen it five years ago when it was the private property of a psychopathic yes. crime family. I mean, but, but I never, no, no, one, no one ever gives any credit to the amazing, this amazing achievement or to the British and Australian and American soldiers yes. who brought it about. And to the amazing American Iraqi um, who, was, uh, who was always uh, beating the drum on behalf of the, of the intervention. Well, these people were friends of mine and I try and do them honour in my book. I mean, there's a whole chapter mm. about the open conspiracy that we had in Washington to try and change the, the mind of the Bush administration and of the Democrats on, on this and to say, look, we have to help We've promised in UN resolutions and in Senate resolutions to move Iraq into a post Saddam. So it's safe for sometimes, me to talk yeah, about Iraq. Sometimes, that's stop, what we do. Some people, um, like religious people, they have doubt that they're following the right path. Did, do you ever have doubt about supporting... I might add that what, I, might, I simply can't resist adding that one of our great enemies was the papacy and the Vatican, who opposed the policy at every single step. And, of course, that one of Saddam's chief lieutenants, Tariq Aziz, Still on, still awaiting trial was a very leading um, Roman Catholic. Do you have? Do I'm, you no, have I'm, I'm only saying that. I mean, my mob, the ordinary GPs at the bottom of the pile, mm. are not necessarily guilty by association with the Vatican. Sure. Well, hey. look again. It's not my problem. But I mean, either you feel you owe a duty of allegiance to someone who's the vicar of Christ on earth. No. Or or you don't. I mean, no, but I'm simply I, I saying be, that's a mistaken understanding of the it. model. But okay, we just daren't, ask Bob, daren't. Bob. I know. Stop. I know. I know. Um, so religious people often have doubt, or sometimes have doubt that they follow the right path. Do you ever? Have, yeah. Do you have ever have doubt that you followed the right path by supporting the invasion of Iraq? Well, my, my politics are based on doubt, so it's it's not so much of a concession for me to make. I can, I can bend without breaking. People, it's people with faith who can't afford. So what about the invasion? Uh, what about the intervention into Iraq? Like if if you see soldiers without legs, well now and we body see bags. now we see the new Iraq and so forth. It's impossible to imagine it back the way it was before. Put it like that. You can't, or rather, it's impossible to desire that outcome. Well, um, although ha the, 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 what I say in the book is that Iraq should have been, in the person of Saddam Hussein, I mean to say, should have been taken care of in 1991 after his eviction from mm. Kuwait. It would have been much better. A lot of a huge number of. Good Iraqis who are now dead would still oh, be alive yes. if we'd done that. What, the, san the sanctions wouldn't have killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, and the, and the, the conditions of economic and 
social dislocation created by the sanctions plus Saddam that made Iraq into a beggar and bankrupt society. So, so what's happening? What's, what's happening in Iraq? Conditions. What's happening in Iraq now? Because we don't get much reporting on it. Is that just because uh, Obama's in charge and the the media isn't as interested in trying to? present oh, a horror happening? story are people what? still getting blown up there every day oh sure because the the pitiless forces of al-qaeda and the former Ba'ath party have been in my opinion for a long time in an alliance but and were in one already but at any rate it's agreed are in one now doesn't make that much difference and who are responsible actually for most of the civilian casualties and the destruction of the infrastructure continue to wage war against the idea that iraq could be a federal democratic pluralist state they want it to be Islamized and made into the part of the caliphate, and they they deliberate. The, the more people vote, the more they put bombs outside polling stations. But at least that has a clarifying effect on on the way I view the combat. I don't know if that's true of anyone else. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, your new book is Hitch Twenty Two, a memoir, and it comes with a free bookmark. That's pretty cool. Oh, well, that's what you get if you have an excellent <laughs> publisher like mine, Alan Unwin by name. Thank you very much for and joining us. Oh. Find bookstores everywhere and try and go to an independent one if you can. But otherwise, just grab it. You thank, won't be sorry. Thank you, Christopher. And not Chris, because I know that gets you annoyed. It Hitchens. does. I promised my mother. Oh, that's lovely. I promised my mother I wouldn't circumcise or amputate my name. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, for having me. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, Appreciate sir. Appreciate it. Sunday Night Safran. With John Safran and Father Bob Maguire on Triple J.